Hello everyone, this is the show with PJ Thumb. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if Greta Thunberg had been born in Singapore? Well, wonder no more. On the 13th of March, an 18-year-old Singaporean student held Singapore's first climate strike in front of the offices of oil and gas giant ExxonMobil. She wasn't the only one. On the same day, a 20-year-old man held up a placard in front of Toapayo Central Community Club saying Singapore is better than oil. Both are being investigated by the police for taking part in a public assembly without a permit. It's pretty sad when solo public protests by people against climate change are treated as a potential threat to public safety. Even amidst the coronavirus crisis, we still need to oppress and intimidate peaceful protesters. They're being investigated for breaching the Public Order Act, which Lee Hsien Lung's government created to give the police extraordinary powers, where even one peaceful protester is considered a public assembly and a public threat. I'll talk more about social control in Singapore in the next two weeks. But it was a surprise to me this week when Prime Minister Lee said in a CNN interview that his government didn't need extraordinary powers to deal with crises. He said, we have not taken extraordinary powers. We put a lot of effort into explaining to the people what is happening so people know that we are level and we tell it straight. We are transparent. If there is bad news, we tell you. If there are things which need to be done, we also tell you. Yes, exactly. That's all that I've argued for all along that there is no need for extraordinary powers to deal with crises. All we need is for the government to be honest and transparent. That's all I've ever asked for. And that's what the Prime Minister says, that's all we need. So thank you, Mr. Lee, and I look forward to your government getting rid of all those unnecessary extraordinary powers that it has given itself, like the Public Order Act, the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act, the Protection of Justice Administration Act, the Films Act, the Public Order and Safety Special Powers Act, among others, because we don't need extraordinary powers to deal with crises. We just need good communication, transparency, and honesty. And that applies to elections as well. Prime Minister Lee, stop teasing us and not going all the way. Just set a date and put a ring on it already. And most of all, stop talking as if the PAP has any chance of losing the next election. As I explained in this episode, of course you're going to win. Even without all the other factors, the fact is that right now we are in the midst of a full-blown crisis. No one's going to risk anything life-changing right now. It's like having sex with a condom. It don't feel good, but we're going to do it because it's the safe thing to do. Last week, I started telling you about how Singapore's elections are extremely unfair. I explained the structural issues which make them unfair, like timing, gerrymandering, and the group representation constituencies. Imagine sitting for your exams with only around nine days to prepare while your classmate gets five years to prepare. And then he gets to pick the day of the exam and he picks a day where he is free, but you have a big family dinner or a very important sports meet. And you have to bring three friends, one of whom must be a minority, and the chapters you are told to study are the wrong chapters, and the paper actually tests chapters chosen by the other student, 
who is the same student who was the one who designed and set the exam. In this episode, we're going to build on that by explaining the qualitative factors that make it difficult for good opposition candidates to run and for people to vote for opposition politicians. These include fear stemming from lawsuits and arrests, an extremely slanted media environment, punishment for those who vote against the PAP, and rewards for those who actually do. None of these actually serve the voters' interests. First, the PAP has a long history of arresting opposition politicians and detaining them without trial, suing and bankrupting them, or otherwise using a legal and parliamentary system to eliminate or smear them. From 1963 to 1988, the PAP routinely arrested its political opponents and either detained them without trial or subjected them to a lengthy trial before elections to ensure that they could not run or were too distracted to run properly. Between 1959 and 1988, around 2,500 people were detained under the various clauses of the Internal Security Act. The justification given was that these were actions against communist, Marxist and subversive elements, but no evidence has ever been produced to prove this, and none of these detainees were ever charged in open court on the charges they were detained under. So the justifications remain unproven. Towards the end of the Cold War, these tactics became increasingly difficult to justify, and so a new technique was introduced, the lawsuit. From the early 1980s, opposition candidates were hit with defamation lawsuits. This includes J.B. Jayaratnam, Francis Xiao, Tan Liang Hong, and Chi Sun Juan for saying things which would be totally normal in functioning democracies like Indonesia or Taiwan or India or South Korea. Or indeed, like Singapore in 1959, when the PAP themselves accused the government of corruption during the 1959 election campaign, allegations which were not fully substantiated. Workers' Party J.B. Jayaratnam, J.B.J. for example, was successfully sued for defamation in 1997 by then Prime Minister Go Chok Tong and other PAP leaders for stating that his colleague had filed a police report against them. This was factually true. His colleagues had filed a police report against them. But the court accepted the plaintiff's arguments that their reputations were damaged by the public statement of fact. JBJ was ordered to pay thousands of dollars in damages and was eventually declared bankrupt after falling behind on an instalment on the damages to be paid, resulting in him losing his seat and his being barred from the 2001 general election. So people remain fearful of standing for elections and good quality candidates are heavily discouraged from standing. To be fair, in recent years, the use of lawsuits has diminished, but it's not gone away. STP member John Tan, and activist Jolivan Wam have been charged with contempt of court, while government critics Leong Si Hien and Terry Shi have both been sued for defamation. For more on Terry, do check out An Online Citizen, a documentary that New Narrative produced on Terry. Link here. Anyway, so between all of this intimidation and harassment from 1968 to 1984, it was common for many seats to be uncontested. For example, in 1968, only 7 seats out of 58 were contested. In 1980, only 38 out of 75 were contested. And in 1984, 49 out of 79. Check out the red bars in this graph. But it got worse. In the previous election, we talked about the creation of the group representation constituencies in 1988 as a barrier to the opposition. Naturally, with so many constituencies requiring three, four, five, or even six candidates, the opposition found it even more difficult to field candidates. So from 1991 to 2001, the opposition didn't even run in half the seats. From 1991-2001, the PAP won even before the elections were run. In 2006, only 47 out of 82 seats were contested. Thus, out of 12 elections in independent Singapore, the PAP has faced an actual competitive election only five times. Of the other seven, four were won even before the election was run, while in the last three, fewer than two-thirds of the seats were contested. Check out the size of those red bars! While the PAP has in recent years been more restrained in the use of overtly aggressive tactics, their effects linger. It's like if when you were young, your father wanted you to be a pro athlete and would make fun of people with PhDs saying that they were useless and all that studying for what? 
and it would force you to go become a competitive swimmer and cane you every time you did badly in your swimming meets. And then over time, you'd gain total resentment at swimming. And the moment he died, you'd retire from competitive swimming because you were so sick of swimming. And then you became an academic instead of an athlete. And you went and got a PhD. Even though he's been dead for nearly 20 years, you still have all this unresolved anger and resentment. And who's useless now, Dad? Thanks to my PhD, I buy my own company and I got a show on YouTube. So my point is that emotional trauma lingers. In Singapore, there is an environment of fear where people are afraid of running for political office and there continues to be a widespread perception that you will be punished by the PAB government if you oppose it. A perception which the PAP has encouraged. As Lee Kuan Yew said, if you are a troublemaker, it's our job to politically destroy you. Everybody knows that in my bag I have a hatchet and a very sharp one. You take me on, I take my hatchet, we meet in the cul-de-sac. This is a man who locked up, banished, sued, or betrayed every ally he ever had. You can learn a bit more in my 2015 video, A History of Backstabbing in the PAP. But of course, terrifying his opponents is just the beginning. Lee was never a man who did things by halves. From the beginning of his time as Prime Minister in 1959, opposition parties have also been sabotaged or hobbled around election time through Tactics such as obstructing the booking of public places for opposition rallies and the granting of police permits for the rallies to be held, freezing the bank accounts of affiliated organizations or even dissolving affiliated organizations, pressuring printers not to print materials for opposition parties, possibly starting and certainly not countering rumors adverse to opposition parties, and sustained campaigns of intimidation and harassment against the individual candidates. <sighs> Lee was proud of this. What we are preventing is duds getting into government, getting into parliament. Look at the quality. Any person of quality, we welcome him. But we don't want duds in. We don't want Chi Sun Chuan, Jaradnam. They are duds. He justified his oppression of opposition politicians in terms of ensuring the quality of members of parliament. But the government does not have a right to veto who the people of Singapore choose to represent them. A more revealing reason for the oppression of opposition politicians was made by his son at a rally speech in 2006. But supposing you had a parliament with 10, 15, 20 opposition members out of 80, then instead of spending my time thinking of what is the right policy for Singapore, I'm going to spend all my time, I have to spend all my time thinking what is the right way to fix them? What's the right way to buy my own supporters over? How can I solve this week's problem and forget about next year's challenges? As if the opposition don't have good people who also want to help the country. As if the opposition doesn't have an important role in any proper functioning government. But the PAP did not just threaten politicians. They also threatened the people, the voters. From the 1980s, the PAP has also openly threatened to punish constituencies which elect opposition parties by withholding or delaying public services until PAP constituencies had first been supplied. They did this by changing how public services were provided in Singapore. Previously, the entire city was supplied by single provider public services, but from 1988, town councils were created that provided services on a constituency by constituency basis. This allows public services to be selectively offered or withdrawn depending on whether a constituency votes for the PAP or another party. And then the PAP went out of their way to make this threat clear. In 1985, after the PAP lost two seats in the 84 election, Minister for National Development Tae Cheng Wan stated that the PAP would prioritise PAP constituencies in providing public services, and future Prime Minister Goh Chok Tong stated that this would make voters, quote, think a little more carefully before they cast their votes." Unquote. And this lesson has been learnt as a resident of long-time opposition constituency Hao Gang made clear in a Q&A with Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in 2011. I come from a SMC, a constituency, where the majority of my fellow people in my constitu constituency decides to pick a Teochew Nang that doesn't wear the white uniform. So my question is, um, basically, why are we being penalised for our choice of MP? And the answer is that there has to be a distinction 
because the PAP ward supported the government and the policies which delivered these good things. But between the people who voted and supported the program and the government and the people who didn't, I think if we went and put yours before the PAP constituencies, it would be an injustice. He doesn't even seem to think this is a problem. He seems to think it is perfectly reasonable to use national resources to pursue a party political partisan agenda. That is the definition of corruption. And most importantly, it reveals a ridiculous zero-sum divisive petty view of the world. And it makes people in opposition constituencies blame each other for failures in public services rather than recognise that the point of elections is to vote for the best candidates and platforms for the good of a country. It's sadly typical of small-minded politicians who conflate their interests and their party's interests with the interests of the country as a whole. Now, you may ask, why is it that the government can affect public services in constituencies controlled by the opposition if those services are provided by a town council controlled by the opposition? Because the crucial fact is that the elected MPs do not ultimately control the money for their town councils because they cannot collect their own taxes. Town council money is dispersed by the Ministry of National Development or through a government-controlled third party like the People's Association. See this graph? That's the amount of upgrading funds disbursed to town councils between 2015 and 2018. See that tiny little blip at the end? That's opposition-controlled Aljunit Haugang Town Council. They got a tiny amount in 2016 and nothing in 2015, 2017 or 2018. So town councils are ultimately a mechanism for punishing people and making it clear that in Singapore, if you elect a party other than the PAP, you will get punished. And the last point I want to make is in terms of unfair media coverage. By law, all print and broadcast media in Singapore are required to apply to the government for licenses that can be revoked at any time by the relevant minister. All print and broadcast media are controlled by two large corporations, Singapore Press Holdings and Mediacorp, both of which are government controlled. The online media, meanwhile, is heavily regulated through a range of repressive laws. The regulator, for example, can and has ordered any post or page to be taken down within a specified amount of time. Due to harassment and all this regulation, the alternative media in Singapore, which is all online, is underfunded and understaffed and unable to compete with the manpower and resources of mainstream media publications. As a result, the mainstream media in Singapore dominates the media coverage of elections. And members of the media have admitted that their work is heavily censored that they publish propaganda, and that their coverage is heavily biased. Like Channel News Asia anchor Stephen Chia, who said this at a forum at a university. Do we do propaganda? We do. Singapore is very unique in that respect. We are not, the media is not the, the third, you know, it's not the watchdog there to, to pounce on politicians and, and, and not, you know, to, to hold people accountable. That's not our role here. Consequently, Media coverage of elections, and in general, is heavily slanted towards the government. In the next few episodes, I'm going to talk more about the broader context of control in Singapore. Today, I'm going to leave you with two points. Remember how I said at the beginning of the last episode that I would talk about the prevailing narrative of the 70-30, where the 30% of Singaporeans who voted against the PAP in the 2015 general election bitterly complain about the 70% who did and blame them for all the problems? Well, between all the structural advantages that the PAP has, designing the election, choosing the timing of elections, the gerrymandering, the GRCs, and all the fear, the harassment, the intimidations, the lawsuits, punishment by the town councils, the slanted media coverage, we can't blame people for voting for the PAP because what else can they do? They have no choice. So we need to stop blaming each other and remember that the PAP created this situation. They have made the elections more and more unfair over time. If you want to blame anyone, blame the PAP, not each other. Because the fact is that the PAP has never won a free and fair election in Singapore. That's a fact. The PAP has never won a free and fair election in Singapore. 
the PAP argued that the majority of Singaporeans support their policies. Well, if the majority of Singaporeans support their policies, then surely they should not be afraid of a free and fair election. On the other hand, Lee Kuan Yew has also said that they make the elections unfair so that the PAP don't have to worry about elections and can think long term for the good of society. In which case, why have elections at all? The PAP also loves to talk about what a disaster it would be if they ever lost power, as if they ever could, given how unfair the elections are. But I will put all those fears to rest today. I am going to tell you the results of the next election. Remember Paul the Octopus who accurately predicted the 2010 World Cup results? Well, I'd like to introduce to you Lisa, the Malayan Sundog who will predict the outcome of the next Singapore general election. We have here four bowls representing the three largest parties, the PAP, the Workers' Party, and the Singapore Democratic Party, plus a bowl representing the new Progress Singapore Party. We're going to put food into the bowls, and whichever bowl she eats from will be the winner. But wait, first we must arrange the situation so that it accurately reflects how elections are run in Singapore. So first, to reflect the PAP's gerrymandering, the PAP's bowl is going to be much bigger than the other bowls. And to reflect the GRCs and the town councils, we will put doggy treats and delicious food into the PAP bowl. But only a small amount of healthy, nutritionally balanced but bland tasting kibble into the opposition bowls. Third, to reflect the fear, the lack of upgrading in town councils and Lee Kuan Yew's hatchets, we are going to threaten to hit her with this rolled up newspaper if she comes towards the opposition bowls. Don't worry, like the PAP, we won't actually hit her. We'll just wave it threateningly, but make sure she still has a free choice. Finally, to reflect the PAP's advantage in the timing, of elections and in the media coverage, we are putting the PAP bowl right here in front of her and we'll put the other three bowls over here on the other side of the room. Now, Lisa is free to go eat from the other three bowls, just like Singaporeans are free to vote for a non-PAP party. We will not stop her from eating from, from those bowls. She has a free choice. Lisa, oh, <laughs> clever and dog. Tell us, which party will win the next general election? There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The PAP will win the next election. Lisa has predicted it. See you next episode. Hello, this is Grouchy the Malayan Sun Bear. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and please share with your friends. Also, please help us make more by becoming a member of New Narrative. It's only 52 US dollars a year or 5 US dollars a month. Imagine how much honey you could buy with that. Learn more about us at newnarrative.com slash hello. Thank you very much.